This conference will now be recorded. Good morning and welcome everyone this morning to a pea, faba bean and potentially red lentil agronomy webinar. I'm just going to do a quick sound check to make sure that you can hear me. Uh, I'll rely on somebody to answer in the chat or to let me know via audio that uh, you can hear me. Can anyone hear me? Yes, good morning, Nevin. Good morning, Prashanti. Yes. And Excellent. thank you everyone for joining us uh, today with this webinar. And I'm Krishanti with McKinsey Applied Research Association. And uh, Nevin with the Alberta Pass Growers will present uh, this uh, webinar today. And I'll uh, hand it to uh, Nevin. Great, thank you very much. And I'm going to uh, allow everyone rather to, I'm going to force everyone to be on mute. I would encourage you to ask questions in the chat feed as we go along. And again, I wanted to let you know that uh, this webinar will be recorded and maybe posted later to the Alberta Pulse Growers YouTube site. Uh, that being said, at the end of this uh, webinar, we will allow ample time to ask questions. Before we get started again, my name is Nevin Rosasson. I'm the Policy and Program Specialist for Alberta Pulse Growers. I do agronomy, I also do policy, and I am surrounded by an amazing team of staff, uh, as well as an excellent uh, and a very youthful board of directors uh, that guides uh, what we at uh, Alberta Pulse Growers do. I wanted to provide a special shout out to not only Robin Boness Davison and Mark Olson from Alberta Ag and Forestry, but also to Dr. Jen Walker, one of my close colleagues at Alberta Pulse Growers for a lot of the material in this presentation. All right, so we're gonna kick it off here. And uh, as we roll through the presentation, if there are any questions, again, please use the chat bar and I will try to get to your question as soon as possible. All right. So what and who is Alberta Pulse Growers? So Alberta Pulse Growers exist because of the Agricultural Farm Products Marketing Act, uh, a piece of legislation that allows uh, farmers to vote to have a levy or a, a uh, I guess a, a percentage or a portion of the gross revenue of sale that will be collected by our organization on the sale of pulse crops within Alberta. So our levy is currently set at 0.75% of gross sales. And what do we as a producer elected and directed commission do? We allocate those funds, the majority going into research. And of course, in that research program, not only do we focus on agronomy and genetics and utilization, et cetera, but we also uh, play a key role in marketing, uh, policy, and education. There's a lot of information on the Alberta uh, Pulse Growers YouTube channel as well, and you're welcome to go there and look at a video uh, or two. Uh, here you can see a, a clip from that video and tells you all about our information uh, services, et cetera. So why grow pulses? We have compiled the top 10 reasons uh, to grow pulses. Of course, the number one reason is that pulses reduce your input costs. We all know that pulses fix their own nitrogen. We're gonna cover some of that today. Pulses also spread out your workload. They're uh, usually the first to go in, in regards to peas and fabas. Uh, in peas, they likely the first crop to come off in the peas region. Uh, fabas, most likely the last crop. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. They do give you diversified marketing options. They break disease cycles. They also provide a second year yield boost. And we're gonna talk about that uh, in regards to yield increase, et cetera, but you, there's been many studies, uh, some conducted in, indeed up in the piece, showing that uh, the returns of seeding a cereal crop on pulse stubble versus cereal on cereal or cereal on canola uh, brings huge yield benefits. Some of the other reasons uh, we grow pulses in a variety of production systems, so to speak. They're very profitable. They've been some of the most profitable crops, even on my family farm back in Saskatchewan. They improve soil tilth, soil health, they promote soil conservation, sustainable farming practices, and of course, uh, we have been seeing how they have been increasing in acres across Alberta. So we made reference to this, and I like coming back to this graph and this chart because this data is compiled looking at published research reports and papers from one of my favorite professors, Dr. Fran Wally at the U of S. And you can look along the <clears throat> x-axis at the bottom there, you have the relative uh, percentage of N derived from nitrogen fixation. In Western Canada, you can see Desi Kabuli chickpeas, followed by lentil, pea, beans, and faba beans. 
Um, those beams of N equals 31, that would be Phaseolus vulgaris dry beams, and they are relatively poor nitrogen fixers, but you can see the error bars showing that there is huge variation depending on the fields, the environmental conditions, uh, et cetera. That being said, faba beans are the highest nitrogen fixing. We're going to move on and start with peas. And uh, peas, of course, yellow and green peas, about 70 to 80% of the peas grown in Alberta are yellow and uh, the remainder would be green and specialty classes of peas. So we're going to talk about what it takes to be successful at growing peas. And the first thing is to look at uh, selecting the right seed. You need to ensure that your uh, seed is disease free, that you have good German, germination, uh, good vigor, low mortality. These are the things you want to be looking for when looking for seed. Choosing the right ground, we're going to talk about that as well, why it's important to uh, uh, find fields that are more marginal uh, than, say, uh, having a lot of available N can impact your uh, nodulation, etc. Seeding rates, uh, very important. Um, and uh, if you look at a lot of the research being done in, in soybeans and corn, seeding rates seems to be one of the most discussed topics between farmers. Um, seeding rates for peas, we've done a lot of research in our recent plot to field um, project, and uh, we're going to cover a little bit of that today as well. Aphanomyces and other root rots, very important. We've seen some root rot problems in the Peace region, and we've seen aphanomyces uh, almost all across uh, Western Canada now. So we're gonna spend some time to talk about aphanomyces today as well. And pea leaf weevil. Pea leaf weevil uh, being one of my favorites because I, I can't stand the pests, but I do respect them. We're gonna spend quite a bit of time talking about pea leaf weevil because it is the largest economic insect pests of peas in Canada. Here we go. <clears throat> seed. Seed is an important part of the equation and this gets back to your management as agronomists and like anything if you put garbage in you're going to get garbage out. So again genetics is so important. Certified seed is very important. If you're not buying certified seed every year, uh, which most producers do not, it may be every third, maybe every second year. Again keeping good genetics is so important. Marketing plans, if you're growing a dun pea or a marrow fat or some sort of uh, specialty class pea, you better have a marketing plan for that. You better have a production contract because uh, if you're outside of yellows, it can be difficult uh, to find a buyer, especially in the peas region. If you're growing green peas, make sure you know who your uh, eligible, um, I guess, buyers or line companies will be for green peas. And selecting a variety. AlbertaPulseRVT.com right here. If you click that link, you'll be taken to our digital RVT um, trials. And uh, Alberta Pulse Growers took over this initiative about three years ago. Dr. De Jen Walker, who's on the line uh, today with us, is running that program with our regional variety trials, and it has been a significant success. So when you're looking at varieties, hop on to www.albertapulserbt.com or go via the Alberta Pulse Growers app and you can look at all of those varieties. Again, seed is a very important part of the equation. Field selection is the next thing and this should have been done probably uh, in the last few months if not into the near future. Uh, you need to know your land, uh, your soil pH, and trouble spots. Most uh, farmers do. They've been traveling these fields for a uh, generation if not two or three. Whoops, I'm going to back up one. And again, uh, you want to match your crop to the field. So we would recommend that if you have fields that have available N of over, say, 35 to 40 pounds, that uh, this may not be suitable for pea crop. This can uh, reduce the potential nodulation. What we can say is that uh, marginal fields work very well for uh, pea and as well as uh, lentils and we're going to talk a little bit about faba bean how they can do a little bit better in those heavier clays gumbo and waterlogged conditions but again peas don't like wet feet so you don't you want to have well-drained uh, fields you you know some of those heavy low-lying spots or poorly drained uh, heavier soils can uh, be problematic especially when it comes to root rots. map out the management considerations you need to implement based on the field crop and again, rotation, rotation, rotation is key. And we're going to talk about rotation, especially when it comes down to aphanomyces and other root rots. So getting to seeding rates. This graph represents our recent plot to field uh, years. And uh, what we had uh, done is we've scaled up small plot research. 
And again, our seeding rates were based on 1990s research under uh, what would have been, um, I guess, common conventional tillage practices. So again, across uh, Alberta these days, about 80% of producers or 80% of the acres at least are looking at uh, reduced or conservation, if not um, minimum or zero tillage. So we wanted to go back and update this research at a field scale level. Again, our plot to field is a, a very exciting research project. We're in our fourth of five years. And you can look, we've been looking at seeding rates and you can see the towns or the closest towns across uh, uh, Alberta. Um, again, we've added a site up at the Mackenzie Applied Research Association. We've been very happy to be working with that organization. So we do have a site in the gray wooded soil again. But again, uh, the recommendations are seven to nine plants per square foot. And again, your seed size will vary um, by variety. That's why it's so important to use your thousand kernel weight. We want to make sure that producers are trying to target that seven to nine plants per square foot. Now, in this research, we've been looking at low at five plants per square foot, medium at seven, and the high range. And what we can tell you at this point is we're still running some of the stats, is that yes, in some of the southern Alberta areas, lower seeding rate may indeed provide a, a better value or a better economic return. Uh, however, when we have higher rainfall sites where we have more weed competition, we do know that higher uh, plant sand densities do impact the weed competition. So again, just some early uh, results from our plot to field um, seeding rate trial, but uh, we will have more information on this coming out into the future. Again, uh, we do want to suggest that to that seven plants to eight plants per square foot will probably suffice for the Peace region going forward. That being said, again, in a year or two, we may have uh, run stats and have some significantly different uh, information based on this research. So I'm gonna move on. Uh, I'm not gonna cover fertility too much in peas. Again, we would recommend uh, phosphorus being placed with peas. Peas are uh, not huge users of phosphorus. That being said, we do need to have ample levels of uh, soil available phosphorus for seedling development. And again, nitrogen fixation. So we would recommend between 15 to 20 pounds of actual pea. Again, your safe place pea rates depend on your seedbed utilization, uh, et cetera. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take some of those afterwards in regards to what are the safe uh, P rates. We do have research in this area uh, uh, ongoing, not only in our plot to field projects, but this year with uh, some of the applied research associations across the province, we'll also be looking at monoammonium phosphate in seed rows. So know thy enemy when it comes to peas. And here are two enemies on the screen. One happens to be um, a Thanomyces, Utyces, and these are actually uh, uhu spores, uh, uhu mycetes, this being a plasmodia or a slime mold that are actually infecting the roots. The enemy on the right is a pea leaf weevil, or as I call them, the, the pea eaten weasels. And uh, we're gonna learn more about those enemies. We're gonna start off with root rots though. So one thing to remember is that soil is different from dirt. Dirt is just ground up rock, but soil is a living uh, medium, so to speak, to which we owe our existence. And it is teeming with life, good bugs and bad bugs and all sorts of bacteria, fungi, uh, all sorts of actinomyces and weird uh, soil jiggers and, and triggers, so to speak. But plants are vulnerable to bacteria and fungal infections, and these include a uh, a plethora of pathogens, including uh, Fusarium root rots, Rhizoctonia, Pythium, and our newest one, again, a little bit different as it is a, a, a water mold, a Thanomyces. And we're gonna talk about how these complexes work together and how they can actually uh, exacerbate each other's. The Thanomyces, Utyces, and uh, some people struggle with the pronunciation. I just go with the flow and pretend I know what I'm talking about. But it was first reported in Saskatchewan in 2012. Uh, the first, came, first case, rather, was confirmed in Alberta in 2013. Previous, uh, the Fusarium root rot uh, was thought to be the, the largest pest, but in 2013, the damage was unusually high, and upon further investigation, we were seeing uh, some of this, this uh, yellowing of roots. And you can see the picture on the right, which has not only a field uh, that's cut down the middle. This is all field peas. Uh, one was grown in a four-year rotation and one 
uh, in an eight-year rotation. You can see the visual dif difference uh, along that field margin running uh, from, say, eight o'clock up to about uh, two o'clock on the screen here. And again, you can see that there's been efforts made with uh, surveys in the past, and you can see that there has been not only P, uh, a confirmation of uh, phatomyces in peas, but also in lentils, uh, uh, shown by the yellow dots. Again, this uh, is, disease is of huge concern. What do we know about a phantomyces? Well, uh, I mentioned this earlier, but the UU spore uh, is its resting spore, uh, but it does need water to move, and it is not a true fun fungus. So this is a type of water mold or a plasmodia, so to speak. Uh, the UU spore actually has a dinoflagella, so it has two flagella, and it can swim in waterlogged conditions. So there are times where you may see um, this type of root rot or the yellowing of the crop that's actually moving up your side hills and onto your knolls under waterlogged conditions. So this is what we know. It can infect a variety of crops and can sur survive as a saprophyte. So it also, again, flourishes when soil moisture is high and uh, high compaction at entrances to fields and headlands as well when you have uh, a high percentage of clay soils. So when it's not adequately drained, uh, sandy or loamy soils, not quite as impacted as uh, some of these high clay soils. And it can infect plants at any time during the growing season. However, we do see the majority of the infections in July and early August is when you usually see the symptoms in the field the most. What do we see in the field? Again, we see the yellowing of the plants. You can see here, they start to yellow, but we do see poorly developed root systems and this caramel coloration of roots versus red streaking vascular, okay? Um, and again, it all depends on how much inoculum is in the soil. And we're learning more about this. Again, Dr. Shama Chatterton, uh, AAFC, Agriculture Negative from Canada, Lethbridge has been leading our research here in Alberta and across Western Canada. And she currently has some projects looking at how much inoculum is in the soil, how long it survives, et cetera. Again, poorly developed root systems, this can also exacerbate the, uh, I guess, standability and can lead to your crops falling over, as well as other root rots, but aphanomyces especially. Uh, what can we do in season? Not a whole lot. We do have uh, a registration of a seed treatment in Tigo Solo that was brought forward in 2013 for emergency registration and has now been uh, registered. Uh, the problem is that we do not have a uh, long enough, um, I guess, suppression of aphanomyces. We get maybe 14 to 21 days of suppression of aphanomyces. And again, as this can infect uh, throughout the season, it does not have control or suppression long enough to be, to be effective for full season control. It can help your seedlings get off to a good uh, start and a healthy crop. So Intigo Solo again, is a seed dressing or seed treatment that is registered. Um, another thing that we are trying to understand is how we may be able to breed resistance in uh, through genetics. We do know, number two, that rotation crops can help reduce spore load. We also know that liming and adjusting that pH to a 7.2, 7.4 is probably the optimum place, which just happens to coincide with the optimal pH of um, club root, which happens to be another soil-borne disease that we can uh, relate to as a phanomyces would be our soil-borne disease, just like club root is the soil-borne disease of canola. Cover crops, well cover crops can again offer a way to um, break disease uh, cycles and again as long as they are not a bridge um, crop for certain types of uh, pathogens or diseases, uh, cover crops can uh, give us a, a way to manage this disease. And lifespan of spores and how we can shorten that lifespan, we're learning more and more about this uh, with our, um, I guess, investigation and uh, research efforts for aphanomyces. So if you feed it, it will grow. So again, if you have aphanomyces and you keep planting peas or lentils, uh, you will keep increasing that inoculum. So you need to test your soil. So we do have information on our website. You can go, there's many labs that will do soil tests for aphanomyces. The cost is about a hundred bucks and that's cheap insurance to know if you do have the presence of aphanomyces. Field selection again, is it to wet, cool soil, high clay or poorly drained? These are all uh, factors that will influence the, uh, probably the, I guess, the 
um, potency of the disease, so to speak, or the uh, the amount. Sorry, I got tongue tied there. But again, the field selection is very important. Use crops that aren't susceptible. So peas and lentils are the two pulses that are susceptible to uh, phanomyces. That being said, faba beans offer a real option in the peace country to break this uh, disease cycle. If you have been in tight rotations of three or four years uh, with peas, you might want to consider fallow beans as an option. I would not uh, recommend soybeans, uh, chickpeas, uh, or uh, lupins, of course, uh, lupins being a newer crop that is not yet being grown commercially in the province. Uh, however, fallow beans would be a good option for the peace country. Ensure good stands. Again, you want to use the correct seeding rate. You want to control weeds and uh, ensure that you have a good plant uh, stand uh, density. Sorry, wrong button. And you want to also notice patterns. Remember, if you see patterns or specific problem spots in the field, you want to make sure that you are treating those as hot spots as you would with uh, uh, club root. And for those of you who have not had club root in your uh, county, etc., when you do see these hot spots, you want to manage them as a spot, not a field, but as a hot spot within your field. Again, this is a soil-borne disease. It can be transferred by equipment, just like club root, uh, through drainage, ditches, etc. So again, um, cleaning equipment between fields, especially if you have had a tight rotation or if you know you have a phanomyces, is one of the best cultural control practices. So we've covered a lot on a phanomyces. Know thy enemy. When it comes to peas, the big insect of concern here is pea leaf weevil. Now again, we have a couple of other insects here that are of concern in other pulse crops. Field peas, pea leaf weevil, again, it would be one of largest concern. Wireworm can also be an issue in field pea. We don't see much um, issue with cutworm, but it can be uh, from time to time an issue. So how things have changed. Here's our pea leaf weevil survey. And in 2001, going back, we had a small little pocket coming in from uh, southern uh, US. And that has expanded to 2008, where we had a couple other small pockets again. And this is looking at notches per plant. Uh, 2013, again, you can see that uh, distribution is expanding northward into Alberta. Uh, you can see here in 2014, well past the Red Deer area. Uh, 2016, uh, into the Edmonton region, et cetera, and north. And uh, now moving on, as you see in 2018, we did see some uh, notching in the Peace region, and we did confirm that there is uh, pea leaf weevil in the Peace. So there is a slow expansion. Uh, last year, we did hear some more reports of pea leaf weevil. Uh, it was uh, still, you know, there's still no uh, <clears throat> clear uh, high risk for the Peace River uh, and Peace region. Uh, that being said, we are working on more predictive tools rather than just looking at surveys. And again, we're gonna cover some of the um, uh, finer points and we also have a video that we're gonna show here uh, shortly, so I don't wanna cover all of the information. But what is a pea leaf weevil? Well, this is what the adults uh, look like. Thank you to Kevin uh, from Storm Chasers for this beautiful fo photo. It's a type of beetle. It does have a snout, it's a herbivore. It uh, chews on your plant. It overwinters as an adult um, for pea leaf weevil. The early spring that lays the egg at the soil surface, that egg hatches and the larvae then uh, find those nodules um, and they basically eat those nodules and uh, chew them right off or chew inside and out. The adults emerge and they, they again begin to feed on peas, of faba beans and other alfalfa crops. So I want to show you a quick video here of uh, some of the research that's being done. And uh, here is one of the tweets, but this is actually looking at the distance that pea leaf weevil can fly. So here, this uh, research shows that this weevil can fly about 500 meters in less than 30 minutes. And here you might be able to see um, the weevil is going round and round. And uh, again, pretty interesting uh, research. But again, this is looking at uh, the dispersion under different temperatures, et cetera, of where these weevils can get to. So I'm gonna try to play a video here and I hope the sound will come through. If it doesn't, uh, please let me know and I will uh, take some action to correct it. I'm looking for pea leaf weevil in the larvae stage, which would be eating these nodules. Now the adult, notches at the base of the plant. You can sometimes see these notches. They look like your grandmother is taking pinking shears to the edge of the leaves. 
And those adults will then overposit or lay an egg at the base of the stem. And when those eggs hatch, the larvae come down and they start chewing on these nodules, which again limits the plant's ability to fix nitrogen and it really can impact the yield of your pea crop. There's a larvae right there, tiny. Although you may see a fair amount of notching on the leaves, the damage that is done by the adults is actually not at this point something we really worry about unless it's severe. It's the larvae moving down into the roots that we're most concerned about. However, the amount of notching on the leaves may give you an indication, Jen, of how bad the, not, the damage to the nodules may be when those larvae hatch. The weevils come out early in the spring, so to go out and scout early when the plants are in the two, three, four node stage, and take a look and get an idea of what the, not, what the level of notching is. And then if you see about 30% or three out of 10 plants that start to see some notching on it, you may start to be concerned, and that's when you may want to take a look. However, whether or not you should put an application of an insecticide on is a topic that we're trying to get some more information on but at this point we're saying that we don't think it would be necessary. The most effective way to deal with the P. legal larva gen is seed treatment. Seed treatment is our best and our most effective option at this point. So I would highly recommend if there's any P. legal in your area, treat your seed. Very important. <laughs> Okay. All right. I am hoping that everyone was able to hear the audio on that video. Uh, I didn't hear otherwise. So, uh, I, uh, again, as Robin Bonas had said, most effective treatment is uh, a insecticide seed treatment, which would be a neonicotinoid insecticide. And again, we do have one registered foliar uh, insecticide that is currently under review with the Pest Management Regulatory Agency. Uh, which would be known as Matador. The active is Lambda Cyhalothrin. It's used under some other uh, names as well, but Lambda Cyhalothrin. However, we do not recommend a foliar application for pea leaf weevil because in most instances, it will be a revenge killing and it will not be actually limiting the amount of, of larvae that are already in the soil or eggs that have been laid. It's basically taking out some of those adult populations. And again, we do not recommend an application of foliar insecticide for pea leaf weevil. It would be nothing more than revenge killing and will be do doing more damage to the beneficial insects, including pollinators, predators, and parasitoids. Again, these are some insecticides available for insect pests and pulse crops. And I just wanted to point out that uh, the seed treatment, uh, again, for uh, Pea leaf weevil would be Cruiser uh, or Cruiser Max, uh, Vibrance and Beans, which is Thymothoxum, or also uh, uh, Sombrero, which would be a mitoclopper. Again, these two are neonicotinoids. Uh, again, sorry, the Sombrero is only on soybeans, so it would just be Thymothoxum. And as you can see, pea leaf weevil, we are at risk of losing not only our neonicotinoids, but also lambda cyhalothrin as they are currently under review with the Pest Management Regulatory Agency. And this is an area where Alberta Pulse Growers has been doing a lot of uh, work. Again, if you have any questions on insecticides, please go and download the 2020 Alberta Blue Book, which you can store on your phone, uh, either as a PDF or you can store it in iBooks. So you can make reference if you do not have connection when you're in the field. Again, this is basically the holy grail or the bible for agronomists and for farmers uh, again so the alberta blue book is available for download and these are the ones that you should uh, be checking out for uh, peas and fava beans so when does uh, using a seed treatment make sense well again if you have pea leaf weevil in your area and you have uh, lots of notching then you might want to consider a seed treatment this year i would not recommend treating seed uh, in the Peace region unless you have a history of seeing pea leaf weevil. But again, get out and scout, look for that pinking. And again, if we have survey results that are high in your area in 2020 and 2021, you might consider a seed treatment. All right, we're gonna jump over to fallow beans and I think we still have about to half an hour left. Uh, I'm gonna try to wrap up in 15 minutes so that there's time for questions. So fava beans are one of my favorite crops uh, from the pulse 
uh, family. And again, the species seed size range of 200 to 1,000 plus grams per 1,000 kernel weight. That means these can get really big. Uh, they're large seeded on the far right. You can see these. These are known as broad beans. They're also called fava with a V, uh, V as in Victor. And those are broad beans. Often the pericarp will be peeled and they'll be served fresh in salad bars, etc. Uh, broad beans, again, eaten fresh, still young and tender. Uh, but the fava beans, we uh, the, these are also known as common horse beans uh, in the international trade uh, lingo or in our, um, uh, I guess, Rolodex of how they're uh, classified. They're also known as common horse beans. Again, uh, high protein, 28 to 32 percent. They should be trading at a premium to peas based on protein in animal feed at most times, but sometimes they are at a discount. And we'll get into that. There's two types. There's large seeded tannin types, and they're preferred for human edible markets, uh, such as Middle East, Egypt, and Asia. And there is also uh, the low tannin, which we'll get to. But uh, this is a staple in certain parts of the world. Uh, falafel, many of you have had falafel before. Uh, it is a very common staple, and it's offered on the McDonald's menu in some countries. Uh, the other type is the tannin free and here's a picture on the left you'll see the tannin containing which have a black spot on the flower and you also have the tannin free on the right which are a white flower without the spots some of your tannins can also be purple colored flowers but they will have that black marking and you'll also look notice on the bean itself many of them are on their sides here but they will have a dark helum which is the crease and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, further so fava beans, here you can see some pictures of them. They're the highest nitrogen fixing annual grain legume and we showed a, a chart of this earlier. Uh, they definitely uh, put a lot of nitrogen back in the soil. They require cool and moist growing conditions. They uh, do like water. They will compete around uh, grasslands, uh, sloughs, in low spots, in heavy clays and in uh, coarser soils, so to speak, or heavier soils. Excellent standability. Uh, early seeding, we're going to talk about that some more. Uh, they can be very high yielding, but yes, they stand well. Early seeding, I highly recommended. Why? Uh, fava beans are tough. The cotyledons stay below the surface when they emerge, so they can hit minus six degrees Celsius and freeze all the leaves off black, but they will continue to grow and grow back. So you can seed them early, even if you get a heavy minus six frost in mid May, uh, they will come back. So again, uh, you can seed them early. You can probably be out there seeding them here as soon as the snow's off the ground. In fact, some people have tried punching them down in uh, late November and have had some success with emergence in the spring as well, seeding into frozen ground. Uh, field selection. Manured fields, uh, manured fields can be uh, 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 tough because you won't get a lot of nitrogen fixation. However, if you do have a lot of phosphorus and pea building in your soils, and if that's becoming a problem, fava beans can be an excellent crop because they do remove a high amount of phosphorus. But uh, again, if you're trying to uh, take advantage of fava beans for their high nitrogen fixation, you want to seed them on fields that are not high in nitrogen or available nitrogen, so less than 40 pounds of available N, otherwise you won't get the full effect of their nitrogen fixation. Uh, fava beans are amazing scavengers and because of that you can have trouble with herbicide residues. Here's a list of some of them that can cause issues. Uh, Lontrell or, uh, is one of those that, where the active ingredient is, can uh, cause issues three, four, even five years down the road if you've had uh, low moisture. Again, just be aware that uh, herbicide residues can cause uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, curling or epinasty at the growing tips. So again, if you are seeing that, uh, look at your herbicide history and uh, just be aware if you're going to be planting fabas to do it on a field where you know the herbicides that have been applied and make sure to go back and double check. Avoid fields with perennial and hard to kill weeds. These are like sow thistle, Canada thistle, all of that stuff that uh, Lontrell kills. <laughs> These are the tough ones to kill in fava beans. Seeding rate, uh, not seven to nine plants per square foot, but you're looking at four. And uh, speaking with Robin Boness, uh, we think five plants per square foot is probably the, 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 the target plant and stand that you're looking for. Seeding rate calculation, again, is critical because of the, the huge seeds. A uh, thousand kernel weight, again, is so variable, you need to use a seeding rate calculator. The best one that I use is on the Alberta Ag and Forestry website. 
and I will find that link and circulate it to Krishanti for those of you who uh, are looking at seeding uh, peas or fava beans. Again, the Alberta Ag and Forestry Seeding Calculator tool is the best place to start. Again, 60 pound bushel weight is what is assumed for fabas, but when it comes down to targeting that four or five plants per square foot, sometimes you'll be upwards of the four and a half to five bushels per acre seeding rate, which is very high. Again, seeding management, you need to use the correct strain of inoculant. Peas and lentils share the same rhizobium species, which is Rhizobium leguminosarum biovar viciae. For fava beans, it's a different inoculant, so make sure that you have. Uh, procured the correct inoculant for seeding fava beans. Again, with, uh, your with your nodules, you'll see that they're visibly red or pink three to five weeks after seeding. And again, with fabas, they have some of the biggest nodules and they're always beautiful, bright red. They're unique fabas that the crop continues to fix nitrogen up until harvest. They are indeterminate and they'll keep cranking out fixing nitrogen. Peas will stop right after flowering. And again, this is one of the big benefits of uh, fava beans. When you do look at a mature fava bean, you may see that there's flowers and uh, pods all throughout the plant from the bottom right up to the top. You will see some places where there may not be any pods. Uh, that's because they are susceptible like canola and like peas and other crops to um, uh, heat stress during flowering. Okay. Formulations for, um, again, inoculant, uh, granular, liquid and peat, just like the others. Here you see um, some fresh inoculant and you can see the difference on the right with massive clusters of nodules. And here on the left, this is just soil rhizobia. You have fewer on some of the uh, lateral roots and less on the crowns. But again, inoculation, inoculant are the cheapest form of insurance and that's the way you get to every ounce of value out of your pulse crops when they're actively fixing nitrogen. Again, fertility, uh, nitrogen requirements taken care of by inoculating with rhizobia. Uh, this is a, looking at some fertility treatments that were done of 20, 40, and 30 pounds of K2O, 15 pounds of sulfur, a complete blend check, 04500 fertilizer, a triple super was a phosphor source, and then six locations were looked at. Yield, 1,000 kernel weight, uh, plant height, and maturity. And uh, what was seen is, you know, Basically, if you're getting, oh, sorry, I'll go back one slide. If you're getting down uh, 20 pounds of P2O5 or 40 pounds, somewhere in that zone would be a great starting point for fava beans in the peace region. I'm going to keep going through here on fabas and wrap up here in a few minutes. But uh, fava beans, uh, again, they're quite competitive. Again, target density 45 plants per square meter or four plants per square foot. Again, four to five would be our recommendation. Again, there yeah, are some limited number of herbicides registered for fava bean, but this is increasing every year. We do a lot of work under the Prairie Pesticide Minor Use Consortium to add fava bean or herbicides, fava bean to the label, so to speak, and that we are seeing a lot more options uh, now for fava beans. Insect concerns in fava beans, ligus bug is the biggest one. Why? Because they move in from surrounding canola fields and they suck on the developing pods. Here you can see a picture on the left of fava bean in the pod, and those mouth parts have gone right through the pod and into the seed, perforating the seed coat. So this creates an injury, and you can see it on the right-hand side. That injury turns black, and that is a quality downgrade because folks do not like to eat uh, discolored fava beans. So with fractionation and more uh, processing coming online, not only around the world, but hopefully soon in Western Canada, this should be a quality factor that uh, has, plays uh, a less important role. Uh, we're hoping that uh, fractionation will allow us to derive the full value out of these, uh, I guess, off sample or off downgraded beans. That being said, for those that are growing for those Egyptian markets, the, the high tannin, a lot of it's being grown in Southern Alberta under irrigation. There has been some very profitable uh, opportunities for the edible human market. Uh, insecticide application does not necessarily improve grade. It's not, it's tough to time it. Uh, again, we have some irrigated growers hitting that 120 bushel an acre on edible beans where they are doing multiple uh, insecticide applications for ligus bug. But again, uh, you know, it can be a concern, but for new growers in areas where ligus isn't an issue, where there is no canola, which is nowhere, uh, you won't see ligus. But again, something to be scouting for and watching for.
especially if you're trying to hit those edible markets. Here again, you can see on the left, uh, there is some perforated seed coats and that discoloration. And again, if you're over that five or sometimes it's 7% discoloration, uh, you'll be disqualified from making that edible food market. So again, here's some ligus bug damage on the left. Uh, pea leaf weevil can also be an issue in faba beans. Here you can see that notching along the um, uh, leaf margin. Again, it looks like your grandmother's pinking shears have been cutting along the, the margins of these faba bean leaves. Again, uh, it is a, uh, a pest of economic concern. Seed treatment is a viable way to uh, afford protection, at least for during that seedling stage when uh, those plants are getting started uh, fixing nitrogen. So again, if, if pea leaf weevil continues to march nor northward in the peace country, this may be something that we're considering into the future. Again, you'll be looking for those larvae in the soil. They're tough to find, but if you can find them, they're, they're quite amazing to see. Uh, how this pest has evolved uh, to, to chew the nodules of not only peas but also fatma beans. Again, here you can see uh, up here on the that these nodules are actually void. They've been chewed right out and hollowed right out. And again, uh, insects like uh, grasshoppers can be problematic uh, from year to year, but again, uh, we haven't seen too much uh, in this case, so to speak. Another, so, some more photos of faba beans standing. You can see the pods uh, potting all the way up the plant. The plants here are starting to turn black and getting closer to that stage where desiccation uh, may be uh, required. And uh, we do have some excellent uh, information on desiccation staging for not only peas and faba beans, but also lentils and other pulse crops. Uh, I would uh, advise you to check out the Keep It Clean website or hit up our Alberta Pulse Growers YouTube channel to uh, watch a video for desiccation timing because it is uh, a little more challenging in faba beans. So I don't have time to cover it today in this uh, uh, webinar, but I will say that you should uh, check it out. One other insect of concern is Bertha armyworm, which uh, has to be mentioned with faba beans. Not only are they a pest of canola, but they are uh, uh, can be problematic in faba beans as well. Uh, once a lot of the canola has finished and is, is turning, they tend to be a late pest in faba uh, crops as well. So again, if you're scouting for uh, uh, birth armyworm uh, in canola, just be aware that they are a, a uh, late pest of faba beans as well. Uh, one other thing, all of these fields had volunteer canola when we do see birth armyworm. Uh, so we need to know that uh, controlling your volunteer crops from the previous year in all situations is important, not only for that bridge, um, I guess, impact for pathology, but also for uh, hosting, uh, in this case, uh, um, other insects like birth armyworm that go from uh, different species, so from canola and to faba bean. Again, just be aware that Bertha is a pest of faba bean. Some of the other diseases of faba bean, uh, chocolate spot is important. It's a fungal pathogen. We're learning more about it. It looks like someone's been melting chocolate chips and dripping chocolate on your leaves. And you can see a spot there on the top left. You may see some of it in the flowers. Uh, and on the top right here, you can see a severe inf infection where it's progressed. So we have been looking at this. We've known we, we have chocolate spot. There are some fungicides available. Uh, in most years, there has been very limited uh, yield increase. However, last year was almost the picture perfect year where we had late season moisture in August and into September. And uh, we heard from a lot of producers that where they did use checks of using a fungicide like Lance, uh, that uh, they did see uh, huge yield increases. We're talking 13, uh, 15 bushels per acre over the control. So uh, in wet years, yes, uh, a fungicide application can pay in faba beans, especially when you're going to see uh, late season moisture. Harvest management for faba beans, again, they're approximately 115 to 120 days maturity, so seed them early. Again, 50 to 60 bushels an acre is a pretty good tenure, uh, pretty good yield. Ten-year average is around 39, that's for the province, that was three years ago. Our yield, I think, is trending upwards. We have had reports of 120, 125 bushels an acre under irrigation, and uh, we did have 103 bushel an acre on dry land uh, near the Vermilion area here about three or four years ago. Uh, yeah, 70 to 80 bushels an acre is not unheard of, and so this can be a very 
profitable crop in that it's very low input, doesn't take a lot of fertilizer, fixes a lot of nitrogen, and if you can get that seven to nine dollars a bushel for faba beans, they can be a very profitable crop. Straight cutting about a foot off the ground, we do recommend rolling. Again, these are a very standable crop and uh, very easy to combine. Uh, faba beans are dry at 16% moisture. Again, just like peas, we would say we suggest starting to harvest them at 18 to 20% moisture and aerate them down if you have aeration bins. Um, and again, you know, setting your combines, start off where you would for field pea or soybeans and work and adjust your combine from there. And crank up the wind and don't be alarmed when you pull into the field. It does sound like gravel coming into the hopper. Uh, but uh, again, not too hard on combines. Um, you don't get a lot of earth tag with faba beans and they are a lot of fun to combine. Now, uh, we don't have a lot of time here, but I know there are some red lentil growers that uh, are growing red lentils in the peace country and there's been some very high yields. It's a crop of opportunity. Uh, red lentils are more determined than green lentils. They offer, uh, again, uh, another third pulse crop uh, option for peace country growers. Uh, I guess most of the red lentils are grown in Saskatchewan, but we do have uh, acres here in Alberta. Uh, we had uh, around almost half a million acres, uh, 500,000 in 2016, and we do have acreage around that 250 to 300,000 acres of red lentils here in Alberta currently in 2019. We are expecting increase in acres again because the prices have gone from 13 and a half cents back up to over 30 cents a pound down from a high of 47 cents a pound in 2016. Again, I'm just gonna run through this. Um, red lentils, we did a lot of research. Uh, Robin Bonas Davidson uh, led this research. And as you can see in 2016, we are at 565,000 acres. Again, based on the insured acres and extrapolating, uh, broke that to half a million acres. And in 2019, we again uh, saw about 285,000 acres. So we did see a huge increase in acreage. Uh, again, this is based on some of the, um, the research that Robin Bonas Davidson has done with Alberta Ag and Forestry. And again, average yield is around 2,000 pounds per acre. So at 40 cents per pound, you're looking at some pretty good returns. Uh, success has been good growing all over the province. Uh, wrecks are due to weather, uh, inexperienced growers, et cetera. And uh, again, when you start off with a new crop, it takes a while to get used to it. I'm going to just run through red lentils as we wanted to focus mostly on peas and faba beans today. But again, some of the things we want to look at, best fields for these red lentils are sandy loam uh, and well-drained soils. They do not like wet feet. They do not tolerate more than 24 hours underwater. Peas, you might get away with uh, 70, 48 hours, maybe 72, but uh, lentils with wet feet, they die out pretty quickly. They are dry, drought tolerant. They do really good on uh, say six to eight inches of rain in the rainfall in the season would be adequate and uh, they can withstand some of those higher temperatures. Again, you need to roll free, have roll your fields free of stones and dirt lumps and uh, some of the harder uh, control weeds are Canada thistle, sow thistle, dandelion, quack grass. So make sure you're using a clean field. And uh, there are some recropping restrictions as well. So watch your herbicide rotations. Uh, cool season crop, you see them similar, uh, actually a bit shallower than peas. And I didn't mention seeding depths for peas and faba beans, but you should be between one and a quarter to, to two and a half inches for peas and fabas. Fabas you can put even deeper, up to three inches. I wouldn't recommend over two and a half inches with peas. Again, uh, red lentils, a little bit uh, shallower. Uh, I wouldn't see them quite uh, two inches deep, inch, inch and a half deep would be perfect into uh, moisture again. Again, uh, lentils use the same uh, rhizobium as peas and you want to inoculate. Careful with uh, air seeders, um, airflow. If you have your airflow cranked right up, you can damage the seed and that can uh, result in um, uh, reduced emergence or reduced plant stand densities. 11 to 12 uh, plants per square foot is the recommended uh, seeding density. So higher than peas at that seven to nine, you want to be 11 to 12. Again, check your thousand seed weight or thousand kernel weight. And uh, as it says here at the bottom, your rate can vary from 50 to 95 pounds or 0.8 to 1.6 bushel per acre based on that thousand kernel weight. Uh, just a couple of other things. Plants can compensate. Uh, they're a different plant structure. 
they're poor weed competitors, but uh, they can they can yield up and do very well. Land rolling again, highly recommended with red lentils. Uh, that's to manage your rocks and lumps, uh, reduces your sickle and guard damage, as well as uh, issues with uh, earth tag, etc. And use caution under wet conditions. Soil compaction uh, is an issue. Um, you want to make sure that if you're rolling uh, with lentils, lentils are pretty tough. You can roll them up. We would recommend before the six or eight node stage, but they can be rolled up to, I think, even safely beyond the ninth node stage. But again, best to roll them uh, after seeding when it's not too wet because you can spread disease as well. Pre-emergence timing is best. And here we go. I already uh, chased myself through this presentation. Up to the sixth node is safe. Phosphorus uh, is a limiting uh, nutrient, the most limiting, most important for uh, lentil. Uh, and again, we have seen that they can respond to potassium when deficient. Sulfur is important too, but it isn't a big user. And micronutrients, again, uh, if you do not have deficiencies, don't go buying fufu dust. Uh, I'm going to jump through and try to uh, complete this presentation as I just want to make sure that we have ample time for questions. If there are questions on red lentils, I will get back to them. Again, small amount of starter, 15 pounds per acre. Don't go above 30 pounds as you will reduce your yield. You will not have proper inoculation. So uh, with that, I want to thank Robin Bonas Davidson for some of her information here on red lentils, as well as her and Mark Olson for some of the information on faba beans as well. And uh, again, I want to just uh, quickly wrap up here on the red lentil section and uh, open it up for questions. So with that, uh, again, lentil diseases, I'll just touch on them, uh, fungicides, but one of the key ones is white mold. Uh, lentils like peas can suffer from ascochyta or microsporella blight. That being said, uh, um, sclerotinia or white mold is an issue here in lentils. Lentils, again, is susceptible to aphanomyces and other root rots as well. And so we've touched on that here with peas. So again, just be aware of that if you are considering lentils, that they are not uh, resistant to aphanomyces. So maybe not a good option if you're seeing root rots uh, and aphanomyces and peas, lentils would not be the option, okay? And again, harvest management for lentils, they don't tend to lodge, they stand pretty erect, but you do wanna make sure that you roll. Uh, flex headers definitely help. Harvest them again when they're still a little bit uh, tough or not tough, but 16 to 18% moisture and lentils are commercially dry below 14. Try not to handle them again for splits and cracks. And for desiccation timing, I'm gonna suggest that you check out the Keep It Clean website. So I've made uh, some, I guess, uh, I've had some shout outs rather. I did want to thank Dr. Jen Walker, who is still here on the webinar uh, alongside me, but again, Robin Bonas Davidson, as well as Mark Olson at Alberta Ag and Forestry, and a lot of the other uh, uh, contributors here that and researchers. Again, it takes a village to produce uh, great quality research and extension materials. And again, just a shout out to a lot of the folks here. And with that, I'd like to now turn it over and open it up to any other questions that any of you on the line might have. Uh, and uh, so I will now unmute everyone and uh, begin to take any questions that you have. So Krishanti, uh, in, I don't know if you want to turn it over or if uh, you want to test to make sure that the lines are open now, but if there are any questions, I'll take those now. So do you want to talk about the phosphorus rates for the peas? Sure. Question from Krishanti. Uh, phosphorus rates with peas. So um, what I will say in regards to phosphorus rates with peas is that there has been a lot of research done. Saskatchewan has done a lot of research on safe place phosphorus. Again, this depends on the, what you're um, trying to do with your fertility in your system. We've heard a lot of producers that have said that we don't put any phosphorus down with our peas, we just inoculate them and throw them in the ground. That's fine, that might work in certain situations and certain cropping systems. That being said, if you are using a three or four year rotation with peas in your rotation, we would suggest that you be soil testing first and foremost. That's the first uh, step in knowing how much phosphorus you should be putting down. 
but we would recommend putting down between 15 to 30 pounds of actual pea. Again, 15 pounds of actual pea could be a little hot of actual phosphorus if you're using a three quarter inch disc opener. If you're using a one inch opener or a three inch spread, uh, again, your seed bed utilization will be much better. Uh, and peas are, are, are quite tolerant. Uh, that being said, you do have to be careful if you're using a disc drill. Again, you want a soil sample. If you're not soil sampling and you're uh, seeding peas, I would recommend again, 15 to 30 pounds of actual pea. And for this, uh, we actually have a, a few different research projects. One is our plots of field looking at 03060 monoammonium phosphate placed in the seed row and looking at what could be the potential seed burn and also what are the yields. We also have other projects looking at the G by E by M, which is genetics by environment, by uh, management practices, having a function on not only yield, but also on protein. So some of our small plot research, which we've engaged with uh, the ARAs this year, looking at, uh, uh, at um, seed placed phosphorus or in the row, with the seed place phosphorus, but we're also doing that research concurrently on our uh, field scale research, looking at different rates of uh, soil based phosphorus. So again, we do have uh, ongoing research in this field. Uh, current uh, recommendations would be 15 to 30 pounds of pea, depending on your cropping system. Many producers like to add a little bit more pea with their um, peas. Some will even set even mid row band or side band additional pea for the subsequent crop. That could be uh, spring wheat or it may be canola in certain instances so again it, it varies any other uh, questions so are there any specific uh, inoculants that is like that can go with the peas uh, faber beans and lentils or one one sort of uh, inoculum can go like with all uh, pulses or? Great question. So the question was, is there a specific uh, strain of inoculant for all pulses or certain pulses? And I alluded to this earlier, the inoculant or the rhizobium strain that is used for peas and lentils is the same. It is rhizobium leguminosarum biovar viciae. Faba bean requires its own specific inoculant and uh, soybeans as well. So again, the inoculant is specific to the crop uh, and you will have to make sure that you verify with your input provider that uh, you are indeed purchasing the correct inoculant. And again, just look at the, the, look at the product, look at the label, make sure that it's, uh, you have your, your um, colony forming units should be listed on your inoculant. Uh, so many colony forming units per gram of inoculant, et cetera. And if you're using some of the peat based inoculants that are um, april that you're putting in row they'll have your your um, pounds per acre based on your row spacing so just make sure that you are lining up your correct row spacing with that recommended rate per acre did that cover your question krishanti sorry i've muted you there you are uh, so i'm wondering uh, when they do select lands do they need to look at the history or specific characters like they don't like wet feet and how about the pH? What is the pH range for peas? Sure, yeah, great question. So when you're looking at field selection, yes, you're looking at a multitude of things. One, you wanna look at your, your cropping history, uh, some of your herbicides, especially if you're considering faba beans as they're scavengers for some of those uh, residues in the soil. You wanna look at pH, sure. Uh, you know, with we don't have a whole lot of acid soils. I'm not aware of a, a very many in the Peace region either, but if you do have a pH below five and a half, you can have trouble with uh, inoculation. There's been a lot of research in Australia as they have acid soils. So if you do have pH below uh, five and a half, you probably will have trouble with um, uh, nodulation and inoculating your pulses. So that's something else to be aware of with pH. Again, the optimum pH for pulses would be around that, be around seven, 7.2. And again, this is the best pH in regards to uh, limiting the impact of the phanomyces. 
Um, so that's something to look at. In regards to wet feet, yes, you want well-drained soils, especially for lentils. They are the least, um, I guess, uh, they, they are not good underwater. So if you have well, waterlogged soils for 24 hours, your lentils will likely die. And uh, you know, peas would be a little, a little more tolerant. You can probably last again 48 hours to 72 hours underwater before your peas will die off. Faba beans are by far the best uh, uh, crop in wet or heavier soil conditions. Um, again, they compete well along the edge of sloughs, uh, in the low spots, etc. So faba beans would be uh, much better suited to some of that uh, undulating or to topography where you do have uh, wet and waterlogged conditions. Any other questions? So my last question is about lentils. So are there any uh, specific varieties that can grow in northern region? And how about what are the heat units that uh, lentil require? Great question. So what are the varieties that are available to be grown in some of the northern uh, regions, such as the Peace area? Uh, red lentils. Uh, small reds would be the only option. Green lentils tend to be a little more uh, indeterminate. That means they need the environmental stress such as drought or heat in order to uh, stop the vegetative growth and to start the onset of seed development. So re red lentils are, are a good um, uh, starter uh, for the Peace region or a good crop to, to try. Again, I would recommend if you're if you're going to try red lentils, it might want you might want to put them out on the back 40. I wouldn't uh, seed half the farm to them. And again, red lentils are more uh, determinate. That means they will reach maturity. As for heat units, uh, it's not really a heat unit limiting issue. And again, in the piece, because you have so many hours of day length, we've seen a lot. Almost every red lentil grower that has tried them in the last three or four years has been able to bring them to maturity and have been able to harvest seed. And we've heard reports of over 60 bushels an acre in the Peace region for red lentils, which is phenomenal. The provincial average is just around that 25 to 30 bushel an acre mark. So again, uh, red lentil represents a huge opportunity for Peace uh, region growers. And again, a, a little bit higher value pulse. So for your economics of transportation out of the region, it uh, may be an option into the future. All right, last chance for any questions as we have uh, just passed the hour mark for today. I'm hearing none. Uh, again, my uh, contact information is here on the slide. It's uh, N Rose Awesome, that's uh, R O S W A S E N at albertapulse.com. And you can always find me on Twitter as well at APG Extension. And uh, Myself and Dr. Jen Walker are always available for any and all agronomy questions related to pulses. And if we don't have the answer, we'll be able to find it for you. So with that, I wanna thank you, Krishanti and uh, Mackenzie Applied Research Association for the opportunity to provide this webinar today. And again, this will be uh, posted later to our website, maybe this webinar or maybe reproducing it in another format. But again, Krishanti, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Nevin, for your time and for the interesting presentation. We really appreciate your effort and a good, uh, interesting presentation. Great. Thank you very much, Krishanti and others. And again, thank you, you everyone. Have, thank you all for attending today. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Thanks again. Thank you.